is that in 20, starting in 2022, uh, the leading cause of death in children is firearms. Yeah. So I, I always remind people, like, I'm from the Midwest. I mean, we have our fair share of guns, I promise you. I do, too. Uh, but gunshot wounds are the leading cause of death in children over the age of one. And that's a problem, right? So it's the first time in 52 years, roughly, um, that that's been the case. So we have definitely got some work to do in, I, I think, uh, protecting those kiddos. So TBI is also one of the leading causes of death in children. Um, it, it, you know, concomitant trauma is kind of the rule in kids. Even if they think they have a belly injury, they probably got a head injury. And it's because they look like a popsicle, right? So like big uh, uh, up top and heavy. And when they fall, like that's kind of the first thing that goes or the head kind of leads everywhere that they go. Uh, so we'll talk about why that's important a little bit later. Uh, so less than five years of age are basically at our highest risk. You know, in our, our trauma center, we see um, anybody from newborns to I think 21 is our the, the cutoff. Most states or the college would say like 14 or 15 years of age. We don't really discern. If you want to bring us a 19-year-old, we will just say, okay. You know, that's kind of how we roll. But less than five years of age is kind of those kids at the highest risk. Um, gentlemen, we make the worst decisions from the time we are little until basically that we die, right? So it, it's always male more than female. And in adolescence, we see about twice as many uh, trauma patients or male trauma patients than we do female trauma patients, right? Uh, <clears throat> blunt, it's, uh, pediatrics is vastly blunt. I mean, probably we're sitting at, I just totaled up our 2022 stuff yesterday or uh, yesterday before I flew out of Kansas City. We're at 79% blunt, 13% um, penetrating. And our other category includes like hangings, uh, strangulation, strangulation, drowning, uh, drowning, all that stuff. I always put a D in there, like drowning. I don't know why. Uh, but yeah, so this is kind of how our mechanisms march out, right? So falls and motor vehicle crashes sometimes flip-flop, but typically falls is kind of our, our biggest one. It is It was last year anyway. The year before was motor vehicle crashes, but, um, you know, they, they kind of flip-flop. Struck by or against an object's abuse, unfortunately, is still in our top five mechanisms in pediatric trauma, which is um, kind of sad. And then burns, obviously. And it's pretty expensive, right? So I know this is a kind of a bit of an old definition from 2008 from the Journal of Critical Care Medicine, <clears throat> but I still think it's 100% applicable and appropriate, uh, you know, this many years later. And it basically says those non-surgical non strategies used to prevent and reverse anemia, coagulopathy, and acidosis in that first 24 to 48 hours of management, right? So unless you're a surgeon, this is really what we're living by, right? Especially in the pre-hospital environment, in the inner facility environment, in the ED this is kind of what we do, right? And I think we're really great at reversing things. Um, if they come in cold, we like to warm them up. If they have a low blood sugar, we'll make it better, right? I think we're great at reversing things. Where I think we, and I say we as a whole, probably lack are those preventative things, right? You know, your trauma bays, if, if you work in an institution, are your trauma bays already warm? I mean, 40% of almost half of children come in hypothermic. So why would we not have a warm environment, right? 55 to 65% of your uh, heat loss, it just uh, evaporates off your body, right? So having a warmed environment, it's great. So may work at a burn center at all? No? Oh, do you? So what's the temperature of the burn treatment room? Hotter than hell. A balmy 70? <laughs> no, it's exact, that's exactly the temperature, hotter than hell. That's what the thing reads, right? <laughs> but there's a reason for that, right? What, and what's the reason? Like, we don't expect folks who have big thermal injuries or big cutaneous injuries or people who are extremely sick to regulate their own body temperature very well, right? And I'm pretty sure from the very basic EMT level to nursing or, or if you're a you know, I mean, a surgeon, uh, they always teach us that kids are really bad at thermoregulatory control, right? So those very basic things of preventing hypothermia, preventing coagulopathy in the, as much as we can, I think are extremely important. Uh, so there are basically two major causes of early pediatric trauma death. One of those being airway and ventilatory compromise. And if you don't know, eight out of every 10 PED codes you run, whether it's in the hospital or you know out of the hospital in the EMS world, whatever, they're going to be airway and ventilation in origin. They just are, right? It's just kind of a fact. Um, we are not going to talk about that though. Ha! Uh, but we are going to talk about inadequate resuscitation or lack of recognition, right? So just some other things we think about hemorrhage. It's one of the most common causes of death in the first hour uh, of arrival to a trauma center. If you break that down a little bit, hemorrhage and coagula coagulopathy cause 80% of trauma deaths in the OR which if you've ever worked with surgeons, no one dies in the OR, right? That's, yeah. We die and rush to the ICU and they go, ah, oh, we're dead here. <laughs> no, it was in the ICU, not the OR. 50% uh, of trauma deaths in the first 24 hours uh, related to those kind of things, right? So it's a, it's a big uh, thing that we should pay a lot of attention to, right? Massive transfusion in adult, pro er, in adult centers show a couple things. One, it shows, you know, decrease uh, bleeding, decrease blood usages, a decrease in mortality, which is really great. 
Unfortunately, I don't think that we're really there yet in the peds literature. I mean, it's, there's definitely some literature out there, but there's not as robust literature, right? So if you think about just the peds stuff, I'd say we're probably five years behind in the adult world. Um, do is there any take care of primarily adults? Where, where do we get most of our information? Like, where do we learn? And not saying that we don't in hospital university settings, but where does a large volume of our literature and our evidence-based medicine come from in trauma care? The, who said that? Yeah, the, uh, 100%, right? The only, thing good war, the only thing war is good for is it improves our civilian trauma care kind of as an end result, unfortunately, right? So when we were in Afghanistan and Iraq for 40 years or however long we, we were there, I mean, we learned tons about massive transfusion, that one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one, uh, protocol for platelets and you know red blood cells and all of that kind of stuff, and that's fantastic. And we look a couple things out of that from PEDS, so like the PEDS track study about TXA came out of the military conflict. We don't just take care of adults when we're overseas. If there's a civilian indigenous, indigenous person that's living there, we take care of them if they present to our hospital. So we do take care of some kind of kids in the military, just much lower volumes, right? So we're, we don't have as much clear evidence that says, oh, you absolutely should do this uh, as a, a, a lot of the adult things do. But these still these basic kind of tenets of ATLS, I think, still um, are still hold true even in the peds world, right? Take the greatest left, treat the greatest threat to life first, which is easy, right? That's why we do the March mnemonic or the ABCs mnemonic, right? We, if you don't have an airway, you don't have a patient. If you're basically just hemorrhaging to death and you don't stop it, then airway doesn't really matter because they're going to hemorrhage to death, and then you know all bleeding stops eventually, right? Whether you <laughs> want it to or not. Uh, a lack of definitive diagnosis should never impede the application of indicated treatment. And I believe that's 100% true. We don't have to know every single thing that a patient has to start treating them, right? A pale, cool, and diaphoretic patient that's tachycardic and hypotensive is shocky from something, right? And we just need to figure out what it is. And I think the last one is pretty easy, right? Just a detailed history is not really essential. It's nice to know that, but it isn't essential to at least start their care. Now, we need to find out more, absolutely. And I think one of the ladies from Florida kind of mentioned that earlier, like it's really important to know what the story is when they come in. It's extremely important to know what the story to come in, right? Those abuse cases, if those kids go home from the ER and have been abused, they have about a 20% chance of coming back in dead. We don't want to miss that kind of stuff, right? Those are just the cases you cannot miss. So what you what they tell you on scene and what the story is really does make a difference because if we go to ask them, oh, he didn't fall off the bed, he wrecked his bike. And that's not really how that works, right? And the story starts changing, things just don't make sense. So where are we at today? Uh, I think balanced resuscitation, I think it's very well published in the adult literature. It's a little bit less published in the peds literature, but I think it's basically equally as important, right? So I think there are some uh, kind of uh, things we can take out of that. The Stop the Bleed Kit, has anybody taken that class? The Stop the Bleed, Bleed Course? Yeah, it's super simple, right? Boy, it is so beneficial though, right? So the Stop the Bleed, if you aren't aware, is a college of surgeons um, promoted and in, invented course that basically stops, uh, teaches the lay individual how to stop hemorrhage, right? Very simple stuff. Direct pressure, packing wounds, and tourniquets. Those are the three big tenets of it, right? Um, and that kind of came from like, uh, I think the last straw um, was basically the Las Vegas massacre. So they went, they a bunch of fancy people, and I think actually Scalia over here at Shock Trauma is one of the people involved in it. But they went through all of the people that died at Vegas and basically had found 40% of those people probably would have survived their injuries if someone would have just been able to put a tourniquet on them, right? They didn't all have head shots. They didn't all have trunk wounds. A lot of them had just big arterial injuries and they just hemorrhaged to death. So this is, we kind of pushed that forward. It teaches very simple things, right? Um, direct pressure to wounds, packing wounds, and tourniquet application. Those things have never been more true. When I started back in 2000, I think it was, uh, you know, tourniquets were in. They were definitely the right thing to do. Who's old enough has been practicing that long? Somebody in here has. I mean, I'm not pointing at you because you look old, but you kind of raise it like a <laughs> finger. Like, like, is he going to say something about me? But do you remember tourniquets were in back then? And then they kind of faded out of fashion because once you release them, bad things happen to the patient. Right. Dumbest thing ever said, right? Because of course bad things happen to the patient after you take off a tourniquet. What happens if you don't put one on? Like at least they have a chance we can uh, fight all the stuff when we take it down. But if you don't put it on, then they're just starting to bleed Kool-Aid, and that's not helpful to anybody, right? So when we look at this, hypovolemia starts, obviously, we get a, a significant blood loss. Our compensatory mechanisms kick in. Obviously, this is not shocking to anybody, and I don't want to get too much into this uh, since we are shrinking it down a little bit. <clears throat> but as your body starts needing more and starts using more, the body produces more right off the bat, right? Eventually, or initially. 
eventually that starts to kind of calm down and we start seeing ourselves getting down this tissue failure, hypoxia and all that kind of stuff. But I always throw a line in kids. I think there should be a break right here. Like you should take a time out and think about things for a very specific reason. So this is again, directly out of the ATLS course for physicians that basically looks at vascular resistance, blood pressure and cardiac output. I have arbitrarily in my own head up here drawn this fancy yellow white line. And I think that's where the average provider would say, we need to do something, right? How many of you, if you see a single hypotensive blood pressure, how many of you are getting blood out and getting pressers out and just like going to town? Not very often, right? If you get another blood pressure and it's low, then we're like, yeah, I think I probably should do something. So that's where I think this line is. Roughly the 80th percentile, I think the average provider would probably say, I think I need, I need to intervene. It wasn't a single pressure. It wasn't that the cuff fell off. It wasn't that I can't read a manometer on a manual blood pressure cuff, which by the way, did you know some nursing schools aren't even teaching people how to take blood pressures manually anymore? <laughs> Boy, we are winning. Uh, <clears throat> I'm in in a good way. Um, so if we look at that kiddo's blood pressure, that's just starting to kind of trend down about here. This is where their cardiac output is. And this is where their systemic vascular resistance is. And the reason I show you that is because of this. If you make your clinical decisions based on only their blood pressure, you are making a grave error in their management, right? We kind of talked about in the early le in the lecture first thing this morning is it's kind of a pie, right? There are so many pieces to the pie. The blood pressure is only a piece, right? There's capillary refill, there's heart rate, there's blood pressure, there's skin color, temperature, and moisture. All of those things factor into it. If they've got a normal blood pressure and a cap refill that's four seconds, they're not fine, right? If they're a little pale, skin's a little cool, they're a little moist, and their blood pressure is normal, they're not okay, right? So I always just tell people, you shouldn't wholeheartedly rely on just the blood pressure. Now, if there's a peds people in the room, they're probably like wanting to throw daggers at me, and that's okay. But realistically, look at the whole patient, and that's what we should really make our judgments off of. Um, this other white line, as you can tell, that is not made from this original chart, uh, because the original chart actually does show that after here, this just continues to plummet. So their systemic vascular resistance starts to plummet afterwards, right? So it's very easily just to point out that when kids become start to become hypotensive, they're not gonna get better. There's no second wind that's gonna save them. It is literally in your hands. And when we get to that point, it's only off the edge of the waterfall afterwards. So we need to intervene earlier. And I think there's the next slide. Oh, it's not, Never mind. Ah, there's a video in here. I will try to warn you before it plays if I remember where it's at, that's fairly graphic. So causes of shock, right? So there's all these fancy terms for shock and that's just great. Um, and kind of what they are. So obstructive shock, we think about tension, pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade. Those are not like new conditions. Cardiogenic shock, we think about cardiac contusions, myocardial infarctions. Speaking of the whole football thing, remember when, what's his name got hit in the chest? Um, I swear to God, 50 people text me like, what do you think happened? I'm like, oh, he got, probably has commotio cordis. I mean, he got hit right in the chest. And my, one of my friends goes, do you just make those words up? No. Yeah. I didn't make that up. That's a real thing. He's like, I don't believe you. And his wife is a doctor, which is even funnier. She goes, oh, I bet he's probably right. And he goes, that's a real thing. I was like, you're a nurse. How do you know? But anyway, I like to give him a hard time. But yeah, so those cardiogenic things, distributive uh, cord injuries and sepsis, obviously, and then hypovolemia or hypovolemic shock is just hemorrhage burns and that kind of stuff. So plasma leakage, right? So there's a couple of things that we treat those things a little bit differently. So obstructive shock, a fluid challenge, especially in the EMS world, if you work a 911 system and you think that patient has a pericardial tamponade and you don't have the ability to put a drain in or a pericardiocentesis, your first line treatment should be a fluid challenge, right? Now, why would that be, do you think? If they start having bad cardiac output or left-sided function, how do we fix that with very basic rudimentary tools? Fluids, right? If you optimize their preload on the right side, you're going to get a little bit out on the left side in cardiac output. Other than that, what are you going to do? You're going to put them on pressors? That's not going to help, right? So fill the tank as full as we can, right? Will there be challenges afterward? Absolutely. There probably will be. But it's either challenges afterward or a patient that doesn't survive. So, you know, we're going to try that. Do you guys, I don't know if there's anybody that works like ground EMS here. Can you guys do pericardiocentesis in Maryland in the EMS? Okay. They can in Kansas. You know, it's super easy. Sub right xiphoid process, aim for the left shoulder blade, 45 degree angle, just pull while you push. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so easy in the back of the end. I'm just pushing and pulling at the same time. Yeah, so I don't know how, I've, I've never seen one done in the field. Mm. And I hope 
not to, but yeah. So fluid challenge, that's, we want to go with that, right? Uh, cardiogenic shock sensors are great. Uh, we don't see impedes very much at all, really. We don't, we just don't very often. <clears throat> Distributive shock, obviously a fluid challenge of pressors very quickly on after that. And then hypovolemic shock, fluid blood, obviously. And that's what we're going to kind of talk about just a little bit more. So th the first problem in kids is there's no real set definition of what is considered massive hemorrhage or what we, what we would consider massive transfusion. That's the first problem is no one can agree. <laughs> and I love all my PEDS people from all over the country, but no one agrees of what is, what is massive hemorrhage in a pediatric patient. There are several definitions. Um, the one I most commonly think is more than 40 per kilo of blood products in that first 24 hour period is a pretty good starting point, right? We always tell our EMS folks, if you give two fluid challenges or fluid boluses of 20 per kilo and you're inbound and that patient doesn't look like a rock star, you really need to tell us. And here's why. You have given them 50% of their circulating blood volume back in non-oxygen comparing crappy saline or LR, right? Which means they're hemorrhaging probably fairly significantly because the vast majority of pediatric trauma patients resuscitate out of shock. I wouldn't say easy, but better than adults. Let's put it that way, right? So if you give them a challenge and they don't look good and they're not looking better, it's time for the full court press, right? So I think that's it. The great thing is it's a very small portion of pediatric patients. If someone tells you they work in a PEDS level one center and every single day they have crash laparotomies and massive transfusion, they are blowing smoke just a little bit at you. Or they're doing it wrong. <laughs> are you trying to get me to bring up that airway topic? Okay, because I'll say it, I ain't mad. You know, this mouth don't have a filter. Um, a, a, an individual that I know, and I won't tell you where from Florida, ha, posted on her Instagram, she's a flight nurse and whatever. Anyway, so she posted, bam, what a shift. I had three crikes and one was on a kid. And so I commented being a nice, respectful individual, did you forget how to manage airways in the BLS maneuvers of which she took great offense to? <laughs> but I was still right. So, I mean, the odds of criking a child are slim to zero almost, right? Uh, and then three people in one shift. I'm like, did you forget how to use an oral airway in a BVM? Like that would have been pretty effective probably. So yeah, you know, when in Rome. <laughs> uh, so the circular efficient differences and, and implications, you know, um, kids will lose up to 30 to 40% of their blood volume before we start to see hypotension set in, right? So again, uh, in the case studies we did this morning, I mean, some of those kids looked fairly kind of sick early on and then just had this massive amount of injuries and turned into just train wrecks. And that's just what happens because kids are really good at uh, compensating. And you can't just say, oh, well, they're fine when we got on scene. Let's just give them the back and we'll give them a ride. And things are going to be fantastic, right? You have to reassess kids over and over and over all the time because they change very quickly sometimes. Uh, and I always just kind of say, uh, the easy things to look for, right? That capillary refill, their skin color, temperature and moisture, their altered mental status, elevated heart rate, narrowing pulse pressures, all of those things are piece of the pie. One good blood pressure and all of these looking crappy is not a good blood pressure, right? It, it might be a good blood pressure. It's not representational of what your patient's condition looks like. Um, so I just always encourage people to do that. And the other piece is when I ask you what the patient's heart rate is, if you look at the monitor, I'm gonna pick that Zola up and throw it at your face. Right, here's why. why, why, why is that? What is the benefit of feeling an actual pulse? Yes, you get so much more information, right? Is it thready, is it bounding, is it strong, is it weak? I mean, those are somewhat down the road indications of their left ventricular function or cardiac output, right? And weirdly enough, if you feel a pulse, then you get to touch their skin, which might tell you, wow, they are a little clammy. Oh, they are pretty cool. Like all of those things go into it. So especially like the new medics, new EMTs and new nurses, and they're like, what's the heart rate? And they look at the monitor. I said, I swear to God, poke your eyes out right of your head. If you keep looking at that monitor, touch the patient, right? Your physical exam is the best tool you have. Don't tell the Zoll people I said that. Um, but it is, I mean, it is. It's that your physical exam is absolutely the best thing that you can use on your patients right off the bat, right? To get a good baseline, where are they at and where are we going? Oh, oh maybe. Okay, we tried, that's all I know, right? <laughs> Sometimes it freezes for just a second. Let's try this again. Oh, by the way, the next slide's that video I was telling you about.
I have to admit, I did put the music to that video, which is fine. I thought it appropriate. So, how uh, do you think that kid was sick? Not sick? I mean, he jumped right up, right? His mom was over there trying to chew her tongue off from a pelvic fracture, just thinking, I'm going to die right here. I'm fine with that. Uh, but that kid pops right up, right? I will tell you, I did reach out and finally found who this kid was via the internet, because you know you can find out anything you want on the internet, which is a little scary. Uh, and he did fine, just so you know. So I don't ever want to think you like, oh, look at the dead kid, a video. Well, uh, so yeah, it's hard to tell who's sick and who's not, right? So we have to be ready kind of all the time. And this is really what the last couple of years has been like, especially with COVID and everything else. We want to intervene early, right? Not when they get hypotensive, not when they look like crap. We would like to intervene before they get to that point, right? So there are definitely challenges, especially in the pre-hospital environment. I'm not going to go through all of those. Um, but the biggest thing is that early identification of high-risk patients. We, in one of the case studies earlier, you know, EMS said basically the car was destroyed and the engine was missing. If you missed that, I'm sorry, because that still boggles me a little bit. But you hear somebody go 70 miles an hour head on. Even if they're acting fine right off the bat, man, the odds are they're going to get very sick at some point, right? If they say, oh, the patient was ejected, you should know in the back of your head that if you're ejected from the vehicle, you're 75 times more likely to die. 75 times. If I was 75 times more likely to get a speeding ticket leaving this building, I'm slowing my ass down. 75 times. We should know those things because it helps us look for what we're looking for. You can also use some other, do, uh, other cool things. So the uh, SIPA, which is the shock index pediatric adjusted, is very handy, right? It's very specific. It's got good specificity when we think about heart rate and blood pressure. Um, and if they've got both of those things that offset, they're seven and a half times more likely to require massive transfusion. We should know those things, right? And it breaks down by age, and that's fine. If you have a good general understanding, then I think we're doing a pretty good job, right? But these kind of things really should, I know they're not in the ACS field triage uh, decision scheme that came out in 22, nor was it in the 2011 because it wasn't invented back then. But we should really be looking at these things and using these things, whether we're activating traumas or whether how we're looking at these patients in relation to resuscitation, massive transfusion. So a long time ago, we did really talk about damage controls in the 80s and 90s. It was very different, right? Does anybody remember, and if you're a paramedic or work streets, I know you know this, but every trauma patient got a couple things. What was the first one? Two large four IVs and two liters of fluid. Everyone got that, right? Like that was the standard. Nowadays, you'd probably get something thrown at you if that's what you did for every trauma patient, right? Because we know that's probably not the best practice if we have other things or if we can evac them very shortly or quickly to a high-leveled center. So I always just kind of tell people, you know, we learn as we go, and that's kind of the goal of this stuff, right? We will know stuff 10 years from now that we're probably screwing up currently. I mean, in 2001, we would starve head injuries and not give them fluid, right? Like we did not want to give them a lot of fluid because you make the brain swell out of their head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, then what we found out is that their cerebral perfusion pressures were zero because we weren't giving them any fluids, right? So, wow, we did not do such a good job back in the day. So these are continually learning things and things that are continually changing. So there are a couple controversies in resuscitation. The first one is permissive hypotension. It was kind of this theory started out of Ben Taub, uh, Ken Maddox in Houston, Texas who basically said, I think in penetrating trauma patients, we should decrease the amount of fluid we give them. Don't give them a big blood pressure. If they can hold a systolic of 90 until operative control of hemorrhage, that's the best way to go. And weirdly enough, Ken was right. His research actually bore out that patients that got less fluid and maintained, maintained a lower pressure at 90 versus the 120 over 80 had a better outcome, lower mortality rate, rate uh, lower rate of transfusion, all these great things, right? Unfortunately, in kids, this just is not a thing, right? There's no evidence to support use of permissive hypotension in children. Typically at this point, because most kids have concomitant trauma, so you cannot starve a head injury just because they've got a, they got shot in the belly also, right? So unfortunately, that doesn't really work. Now as for hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers, there is a study going on somewhere out here on the East Coast um, dealing with those. This is polyheme. Uh, when I was a flight nurse, we were trialing that, and it looked like black charcoal. Um, and I'm going to be honest, you know, every time, like sometimes you're like, I am not taking that cooler because I am lazy today. I may have had a couple of those moments when I was a flight nurse because, you know, three flights a day just kills you so busy. When I worked ground, we ran 18 to 23 calls a day. So three was like just killing me on my aircraft. So I would never take this cooler with us because I was like, I'm not taking that. Shit. It's experimental. I don't even know what it is. And I don't have time. Uh, and so uh, come to find out it was killing patients. So then I was like, look at me, good decisions. Retrospectively, I made them. 
so we're not going to do that, right? Un unfortunately, it's just not there. There's really no um, evidence in smaller children. In, adult, in uh, adolescents, there may be sim similar physiology, and that might be worth a try. But in smaller kids, it's really just not, right? So the early signs, cap refill, IV access, whether it's IOs, big lines, EJs, I'm okay with all of those good things. I love EJs. It's my favorite. I'm sorry to say, but it just is. Um, and then colloids versus blood products. So again, the ATLS revisions from the early editions to the eighth, now we're in the 10th edition, um, which is really great. It says, but I like how we went from two liters for everybody to consider one liter. And then we'll kind of see what that happens for class three and four shock, which of none of us remember what that limit is, right? If you do, good job. So these things are great. The life flow was actually invented by somebody out here, I wanna say in Philadelphia, one of the docs, ER docs up there, who I was talking mad crap on that device at the Virginia EMS conference. And he's like, hey, by the way, uh, I invented that. <laughs> and I was like, hey, by the way, why don't you give me one to play with or I'll stop talking crap on you. He's like, okay. So it worked out of my, uh, my benefit. So massive transfusion in kids. I know we're out of time. I just wanna finish this up just real quick. Um, so there's a lot of evidence of the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one in adults. I think it's fairly similar in kids. Most of that will hold up to be true, right? I think herb, early blood product usage in kids is beneficial. I don't think there's a mountain of evidence out there for it, but I think at this point, it's the right thing to do, right? Um, transfusion triggers, we don't need to transfuse kids who have hemoglobins of eight, that's fine. They don't really need blood products. And I don't know if anybody knows Peter Ree, he's the University of um, Arizona. He's the trauma medical director, fantastic surgeon, but he has a lecture called Blood is Bad. And I think we just always have to remember that for every good thing we do for patients, there's always a bad outcome. So his last paper, I think, was a while ago, but it published and said basically for every liter or every unit of blood you give somebody, you're increasing their mortality rate by 1%. So again, we just have to be cognizant of those kind of things, right? Not saying we shouldn't give blood, but we should just be aware of it. Does anybody use TXA in kids? This is the last thing I want to talk about. Do you? Nice. I love that. Uh, does anybody else not use it? Does anybody have a protocol to give it in adults, but not in children? Yeah? That, mm, mm. Uh, so I will just tell you what I think, and it's supported by the evidence. That's dumb. Uh, we use TXA in spine surgeries in kids. We use it in dysmenorrhea for heavy uh, menstrual cycles. We use it for um, nosebleeds. We use it in complex spine and pelvis surgery. It's a 35-year-old drug that we've just found may have another use. It's 18 cents a vial or something crazy, and you could probably charge $1,000 for it. I think we should be throwing this at kids like it's holy water, right? I think this is the right thing to do. The evidence would tell you as of this point right now, <clears throat> in the adult world, there are absolutely indications like, oh, they could have increased thromboembolic events. That is not true in the pediatric literature at this very moment. Will that change? Maybe. But we don't see kids throwing DVTs and PEs left and right. So I think this is the right thing to do. Here's what we use for our dosing. If they're less than 15, we give them 15 per kilo up to a one gram max. If they're adult or post pubescent, we give them the one gram max. I think it's singly at this point, one of the best things that we can do for kids that are hemorrhaging. I, I, I truly do. Uh, so I know that was very quick. So thanks for having me. Uh, I'm gonna fly westbound this evening. So uh, you guys have a good rest of your time and warm up a little bit. It was nice yesterday. It's a little chilly today. Okay, good. Have a good day, guys. I'm around if anybody's got any questions too.